Venga, se hace. Give me a second. <clears throat> All right, welcome back, everyone, guys. And I wish uh, and I hope you had a good Dashera. And uh, there was one more Indian festival, I believe, Eid, Eid uh, in South India. So, <clears throat> and uh, the Navratri and many things in between. So, uh, welcome back after all of that. I will start today by reviewing what we did the last time. By last time, I mean two weeks ago. Now, in the previous week, uh, which was uh, <clears throat> which we didn't hold a session because of the Dashera slash Navratri festival, uh, we were supposed to do a lab on multiple multivariate regression. Means, how do you do regression when there are many predictors involved? Today, actually, I'm not going to do that lab today. I'm instead going to do classification which is an important topic. And in the next two weeks, we are going to do labs on both regression, multivariate regression, and on classification. So we'll have two subsequent weeks that are just labs. After that, we will eventually have a little bit more on classification, and then we'll uh, do, deal with clustering. Right? And that will, uh, that will sort of sum up the scope of this particular workshop. So uh, coming back to what we did last time, let's, let's have a quick review. The previous time we talked about regression and understanding the uh, understanding regression uh, a little bit more in detail. So we said, if you're seeing my screen, <clears throat> that a regression model is sort of like a machine. You give it as input a set of features, x1, x2, uh, all the way to xd. Uh, let's say d different predictors. An example could be uh, on a beach. It could be the temperature at the beach, the wind speed at the beach, the day of the week. And then uh, <clears throat> the output is you're trying to predict how much ice cream would be sold uh, by your shop if you are an entrepreneur. Uh, how much ice cream will you sell on that given day to the children on the beach? So keep that one example sort of in your mind and it will help you concretize our discussion. Now, regression is considered part, it's, 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 it is the quintessence of predictive modeling because you are predicting something. The target variable that you are predicting, the output that you are predicting is a number. Right? So it belongs to the field of, uh, so this Y, uh, now a little bit of notation, I will just enter this, this capital R, with an extra bar attached to it, with a with a sort of unnecessary bar attached to it. This is in um, in the field of machine learning and in mathematics in general. This is a symbol of real numbers. Real numbers. Real numbers are any kinds of numbers, rational or irrational, negative or positive, fractional or whole, between minus infinity and plus infinity. Any number. Basically, <clears throat> your concept of all that is a number. The word real stands for the fact that it is all along from minus infinity to plus infinity, but it does, but it excludes complex numbers or imaginary numbers, right? So only real numbers. So uh, when we take a regression model in the simplest form, you can think of it as a machine that takes inputs and manufactures or somehow magically uh, grinds the machinery inside it and then comes out with a number. Are we together? Like, for example, how much ice cream would an entrepreneur sell on the beach? That is a number, and that's what it comes out with. Now, with that, in, with that conception in mind, we uh, became familiar with many uh, words that people use in different textbooks. The inputs are called, well, I call them inputs. They're also called features. They're also called predictors. They're called independent variables, the regressors. And the response, the output, is often called the target variable, the output, the response. These are the three words that you will see me use for output. In statistical literature, you also see the word dependent variable, 
very rarely do you see the word regressant <clears throat> uh, used, uh, but you might. So these are all the words, uh, more or less they are synonyms, and people in different traditions use different words for that. Right? And uh, the input side, same is true, features, inputs, predictors, I would be using them quite often. Very rarely would I use words like independent variable, and almost never use the word regressor and things like that. On the other hand, classification, we realized, was uh, exactly the same kind of machine, except that what you're predicting is not a number. You're identifying the, the object, the, the, the attribute, whenever you're given features, you're saying these features belong to an object that is, for example, a cat, a dog, a duck, a cow, or something like that. In other words, you're identifying a type or predicting that these features belong to um, an object of a given type, right? So you're identifying a class and that is classification. That's the word classification. Both of these classification and regression to the extent that they predict, they're called predictive models. They are also called supervised learning uh, algorithms. The word supervised learning algorithm comes from the fact that you have to, you, this machinery will not work till it has learned, till you have trained it. And to train it, you need to take, give it training data as we saw in the lab, you give it training data, it learns from the training data, it fits to it, and then uh, it figures out the relationship between the input and output, it, it comes up with some internal conception of it, and then uses it to generalize, to be now able to predict the value for any given input <clears throat> that it has not seen. So such algorithms are supervised learning algorithms. As we will learn later on, there are other classes of machine learning algorithms. For example, there is pattern recognition. Pattern recognition is not in the business of predicting anything, but it's looking at the data and it is looking for some interesting pattern in the data. The, a quintessential example of that is clustering. It, it happens to see if there are clusters present in the data, so the data is not randomly uh, distributed, but it's sort of forming clusters, it will detect that. Another form of pattern recognition is, I mean, sorry, uh, yeah, pattern recognition would be dimensionality reduction to notice that the data actually belongs to a lower dimensional space and so on and so forth. And then there are generative models and many things, very interesting uh, sorts of model. So these sort of algorithms are called unsupervised learning because there is no giving, training the model. The model gets the data and recognizes patterns and tells you about it. It does not after that go and make any predictions as such. So that is unsupervised learning. There is a third form of learning, which is called reinforcement learning. It is the, the sort of carrot and stick learning that uh, we as children are used to receiving from our teachers you know, uh, in the early school years. Uh, good, good results, positive behavior, we get rewarded, we get carrots. And then uh, if we don't behave ourselves or we do something that is unacceptable, uh, then usually there is some sort of penalty. We are made to stand up on our desk or uh, I don't know, um, uh, there's a timeout or whatever it is. Uh, so it's a, a reward and penalty mechanism, carrot and stick mechanism. So when you teach an algorithm, uh, you, you give an algorithm and say, go play this game, but you don't give many rules. But what you say is, if you do some things right, if the outcome is good, you get a reward. If the outcome is bad, there's a penalty. And then the algorithm learns from it. That is reinforcement learning. Now, all of these things are very, obviously, these are at the heart of, this is, Machine learning, these three, the broad areas of machine learning, uh, they are just about everywhere we look. And uh, breakthroughs are happening all the time. In the two weeks that we haven't met and we are meeting now, uh, some of you may have heard, uh, Tesla, one of the makers of, uh, uh, they're trying to, the electric car company, uh, actually here in my city itself, very close to my house, they make uh, these uh, lovely cars and they strive to make self-driven cars, fully automated cars. Now, fully automated is a distant dream uh, still, but uh, recently they had a, quite a big breakthrough and these cars are able to drive in the city on their own, weave through the traffic, come to stoplights, avoid dangers, avoid parked cars and so forth. And they're able to do all of that on their own. And of course, they're able to drive on the highway on their own. Uh, 
So it was a huge uh, step forward uh, in the field, in, in the space of, uh, or in the journey towards automated uh, driving. Now, when you look at those breakthroughs and you see, and you ask which form of uh, machine learning is being used, you'll realize that those are very complex bees and there's a lot of learning that's happening supervised learning, that is predictive modeling or pattern uh, or object detection. It is looking at the road and it is detecting the presence of cars, the presence of people right? the, and, the, and uh, empty spaces that it can drive to. It is deciding that, the, yes, the road is free, the street is open and that it can go. It is detecting the traffic light and not only detecting the traffic light, it's trying to, it is able to figure out whether the traffic light is allowing you to go move forward or not, yellow, green, red, and so forth, whether you should get, whether you should turn left, right, and so forth. Um, it is making a lot of decisions. You give it an endpoint and it is weaving through the traffic, figuring out a path from here to there, uh, through all this traffic, uh, using the maps and uh, going there. When you do things on this grand scale, uh, obviously it is not just a little bit of machine learning, but a whole lot of machine learning that goes into it. Uh, if you stay with me, um, I mean, well, I guess this one, uh, I don't know whether you guys will continue or not, but the bash that is uh, with me, for example, on Mondays and Wednesdays, uh, they are, for example, going to be doing in just in the, just the next month, object detection and uh, seeing how you can train a neural network to recognize, given a picture of the street, for example, uh, it can recognize all the objects in it. It can recognize the animals, the, everything in it, uh, in any picture. And uh, you, you begin to then uh, decompose or see how these very complicated uh, AI machines work. Uh, in the in the few weeks that we are talking about, there's been I mean all sorts of breakthroughs keep happening. Uh, one person has trained an AI machine to detect whether a person has COVID, this coronavirus, by just recording the sound of the cough, the sneeze, and passing it through an AI a neural network, uh, basically a regression model, and or, or so, and the regression model will score how likely it is that you do have COVID and things like that. So breakthroughs are coming all the time and it's really good to stay in touch. Uh, speaking of which, I'd like to remind you that every Sunday at noon, California time, which is actually brutal, I suppose, for India time, it's 12.30 at night um, on Sunday. We do have a research paper reading. Every week we read one research paper. Um, I announce ahead of time which research paper we'll read and we then discuss the breakthrough. So uh, this may not be of much interest to people who are in India because the, the, the hours are rather brutal, but for the California people, in case you're not aware, just as a, uh, just as a for your information, we do have a research paper reading section every Sunday. Right? Also at this stage, if uh, this is your first engagement with machine learning, uh, it may be a little premature to uh, start uh, getting involved with that. But whenever you guys feel confident, you're welcome. So we talked about regression and now we took the example of a linear regression. In the linear regression, we try to fit a straight line to data. When we try to fit a straight line to data, but, so suppose you have data like this, there can be many uh, straight lines that can fit. Now the question is, how do you find the best fit straight line? And so that brought, up, brought, it, brought us to the concept of data and the parameters, the hypothesis, uh, the hypothesis space and the parameters there. And how do you quantify the error? If you remember, we talked that the gap between prediction and reality is the residual error. And you need some way to accumulate or aggregate these residuals to quantify the error. And the two ways that we learned about was the mean absolute error. You just take the absolute values of the errors or you take the mean squared errors. You square the errors and you take it. When you square the errors, uh, it is the most common way of doing it, mean squared error. For many reasons, it's a preferred way. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I mentioned this mathematician, great mathematician, Carl Frederick Gauss. Uh, Gauss is, of course, considered the prince of mathematics. 
uh, he's a person obviously uh, of the same caliber or, may, uh, or but in a different area as uh, india's ramanujan ramanujan was perhaps the greatest number theorist in existence uh, who ex ever existed in the same way uh, uh, Gauss is considered to be the prince of mathematics. He made prolific contributions to analytical mathematics, the calculus kind of math. But anyway, so one of his results was he proved that if you have to choose a way to quantify error, then under certain circumstances, well-behaved circumstances, uh, it is best to pick the mean squared error as your uh, measure of error, and then try to minimize it, that is the least square um, method, the method of least squares. And that actually happens to be the Gauss-Markov theorem we talked about last time uh, for anybody who is mathematically inclined, but we won't get there. So given the error, the question is, how do you get to the bottom? How do you minimize the error? You can't just be drawing random lines and checking which one best fits your data. So what you do is you actually go into the hypothesis space and you do something called gradient descent. So to understand gradient descent, I talked about function. We talked about the concept of slope. The slope is nothing but how much height you gain or climb up if you move unit distance in the positive direction. So let's say that you move one step in the positive direction and you gained height of three units of height. So you would say your slope is three. That's all slope is. And that's a geometrical way of looking at it. And in a more algebraic way, people call it, it is the derivative of the function or the curve that represents the, 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 the path on which you are walking. Okay? It gives you the, sl uh, the of that path, or it is the derivative. Right? The, the steepness is the derivative of that. And so people have created a lot of, of course, as you may have gone through in school, uh, if you did uh, do calculus, there's the whole bit of machinery that talks about differential calculus. And uh, at the end of it, once you, re once you uh, put the machinery, the mechanics of differentiating all sorts of different kinds of function, the bottom uh, idea is just a simple idea given any function, if you, were, if you were a little ant walking along that function at any given point, how much altitude would you gain if you move forward a unit distance? So that is that, and that is the derivative. Now, we talked a little bit about that, and we realized that if you want to move to the minima of a function, like if you want to go home, which, uh, which is the point at which the function achieves a minima, the best way to do that is to go against the slope, right? And uh, this is a recap of the last time. We came to this rule. This rule, which basically said that the, your next x value should be your previous x value, and then go against the slope and where alpha is the learning rate. And when you do that, you have the famous uh, equation of the gradient descent, because when you generalize this idea to higher dimension functions, uh, the generalization of slope is something called gradient, and you have the gradient descent. So machine learning at the end of the day is putting together two very simple ideas. It is first trying to create a function that maps the input to the output, right? Uh, and then it says, basically that function will have all sorts of parameters. Then you go into the parameter space, you pick some function, some uh, set of values for the parameter, let's say some straight line or something like that. Then you calculate how much error there is. For example, in the case of uh, linear regression, you pick the, excuse me, the mean squared error, or the sum squared error. Then the next question is how do you minimize the error? Learning is the minimization of the error as we talked about. Right? And so that is the process of gradient descent. And uh, much of machine learning can be reduced to the learn, the word learning is, is often a reduction of some objective function. In this particular case, the objective function is just your uh, sum squared error or the mean squared error. Right? So that is, that is a recap of our last time. We also talked about this convention that we'll follow Whenever we talk of data, we will use Roman letters, X, Y, Z, A, B, C. But when we talk about concepts or um, parts of our concept, like for example, a straight line 
uh, that fits the data. A straight line is a hypothesis. It's your idea. It's your theory. And so the pieces that make up the theory, namely the intercept and the slope, uh, those are the parameters of this of your model. We will use Greek letters. We'll use alpha, beta, gamma, and so forth. In particular, your textbook tends to favor the uh, the betas very much. You see the betas here, beta one and beta two, as the intercept. Uh, beta naught is the intercept, and beta one is the slope. That's how you choose it. And so this is a question that when you look at the error surface, the error surface seems to have a parabolic structure, paraboloid structure. And uh, the shortest path home is the path of gradient descent. And you can do that to find the best value of that. The next concept we learned about last time was that of bias, variance, trade-off. So what are the bias and variance represents the two kinds of disease or two kinds of errors that you can have in your model. So we talked about basically uh, errors that you can do something about and then errors that you cannot do anything about. So these errors are the reducible errors. So as you play around with your models, different models, you will have some bias errors and some variance errors, but your model will also have irreducible errors. The irreducible errors will come from noise in the data. They will come from just practical uh, mismeasurements. And it will also come from uh, the fact or acknowledging that there are factors not given to you in the data that are effective. For example, if temperature is the only thing that you are given in a data in a uh, in a spreadsheet and the amount of ice cream sold, it is very hard because uh, under the same circumstances, the same temperature, how windy it is will determine how many children will play on the beach. Uh, whether it is a work day or a holiday will determine how many children come to the beach because if the parents are busy at work and the children are busy in school, uh, they are not coming to the beach. Right? So for the same temperature, you'll see a variation of readings, how much ice cream you were able to sell. Right? And so suppose you don't have that data, you don't have other data like day of the week and the uh, wind speed, etc. Then in your model, you will have irreducible error acknowledging the fact that the model, uh, that the data does not capture the whole reality. Right? So in a way, it is that which the model does not know at all because the data doesn't uh, doesn't have support for it. So there are three, so the, uh, removing the irreducible error, which is coming from those sources, the reducible error, the error that you can do something about by picking better hypotheses, making better models, those, your model errors fall under two types, the bias errors and the variance errors. I give you guys an intuition of bias and variance. So if you look at this picture, let me call A and a B and C. A is what you would ideally like. Suppose you're shooting at a dartboard, you're hitting very close to the mark, to the target. A B happens to be what you call the bias errors. Uh, in other words, all you're, you're hitting actually very well, except that you're shifted, you're hitting at the wrong bullseye to you. Uh, you're hitting at the wrong place or aiming for the wrong place, uh, but you're getting to that wrong place quite well. Right? So those errors are bias errors. And then you have the variance errors when uh, where you're hitting is all over the place. Right? You have a, a huge variability in uh, the location or the prediction uh, of your data. So it is all over the place. And so that is high variance errors. Right? The C represents the situation of high variance errors. So high bias errors tend to appear in models that are overtly simple. High variance errors tend to be in models that are overtly complex. And so we came to, uh, it is worth reviewing, this famous diagram in machine learning that keeps happening all the time. By the way, it also happens to be one of the most, uh, uh, most asked interview question in data science interviews. For some reason, it's a favorite of people. Uh, so, and, and perhaps for a good reason, because uh, it just validates, you know, this core idea of machine learning. It basically says that as you make your model very complex, your bias errors will come down, but your variance errors will go, go up. It will start overfitting the model and you, but because your total error, which is the green line here, is the sum total of bias and um, variance errors, 
you will reach a point in of complexity at this point that we have drawn where the you have the optimal error optimal model a model in which you have the least total error right in which the forces you are neither too simple nor too complicated and if you inspect your data if you go back and if you happen to know what your data looks like uh, or what the force behind it is you'll often find that this point of lowest total error the balance between bias and variance error uh, builds a model that pretty much resonates with the ground truth right and so that is that now uh, there's another last thing i talked about so bias and variance you tend to have sort of a trade off variance is overfitting making overtly complex models now uh, let's come to a principle the last thing we talked about was the occam's razor principle what was the occam's razor principle it said that suppose a uh, two theories can explain a data and maybe make equally good generalizations from the data then science defines the has a definition for the correct one it says because in the absence of any uh, there is no such thing as see mathematics as correct and not correct right 2 plus 2 is 4 2 plus 2 is not 11 and so forth in in ordinary uh, arithmetic there are systems where that could be true but in ordinary arithmetic 2 plus 2 happens to be 4 right uh, but not 11 you say 11 is incorrect 4 is correct science is different in the sense that you can tell if an answer is wrong but you can never tell if an answer is right there's no right in science so in science we define right by construction but we say that if two models are better than all other models but they are and they are equally good in terms of their predictive power and so forth uh, in, ter in terms of generalization or explaining data then the correct one the is defined as that one which is the simpler of the two right so that is the occam's razor principle and that's very important so whenever you build models you have to ask yourself that is there a model that is equally effective equally good at making predictions and generalizations and so forth but uh, which is simpler than what i have built because if you have then you hop to that and say well this is a better model this is a more correct model in some sense right and one way to illustrate that is uh, something like this suppose you have uh, two models for um, helping people manage their diabetes right? one model says uh, if somebody has diabetes uh, and this is the amount of sugar level they have they need to do a whole complicated regimen wake up exactly at 6 between 6 and 6:30 and then do this much of food and this much of exercise and this much of walk and then uh, it's a very complicated regimented uh, system that the model predicts or prescribes so imagine going to a doctor who gives you this very complicated regime the second uh, model is uh, and let's say that the another doctor is using a simpler model and that model basically says if you have diabetes you better exercise more and eat less it cut down on food and sleep more exercise more sleep more uh, eat less less carbs right now which of these would you consider a more uh, likely more likely likely advice to be followed you would agree that uh, if a doctor gives you simpler understandable uh, advice that follow just three things sleep well exercise more than whatever you are exercising and eat less than what you are eating and that will make a huge improvement on your type 2 diabetes adult onset diabetes you would say well that is a clear instruction i can go follow but if the doctor gives you a very long and complicated regimen that must wake up at this time and eat this and so much of spinach and so much of rasam and no more than this uh, then you would agree that uh, uh, you would you would be able to uh, follow it for a bit but ultimately give up you'll get completely lost in the details okay so that's the difference between simple and complicated model so always simpler is the preferred one Okay, right, guys. So that is a, a summary of what we did last time. I believe I also gave this example of the solar system. Uh, the Kepler solar system puts Earth, the Sun uh, at one of the focal points of an ellipsoidal orbit, ellipse orbit, 
and the planets are in ellip elliptical orbit, right? which is much simpler than the uh, old Ptolemy's astronomy, which put Earth as, as the center and all these planets and uh, the stars, they seem to be somehow wobbling around the heavens, uh, you know, in sorts of these epicycles. Right? So calculations were a lot more complicated, whereas the, the Kepler model made the calculations a whole lot simpler. So from a science perspective, uh, which is correct? So the, the thing is definition. So you can say that it's just a matter of perspective in the universe. There is no stationary object. The sun itself is not sitting quiet. Uh, it is just a star in the galaxy. And so it is moving, uh, spinning around in the galaxy. Then the galaxy itself right, is not stable. Uh, it is moving around in the universe and so on and so forth. So everything is in flux. Everything is in motion. So what difference does it make whether you take Earth as the center or the sun as the center? And so the scientific answer there is that now it is preferable to put the sun at the center of a planetary system because it leads to much, much simpler models, much, which, where, which makes calculations much easier, much simpler. It is a conception that helps you reason about our solar system and the universe in a much more elegant and simpler way than using the old model of Ptolemy. Uh, where the earth used to be stationary and everything is moving around the earth. And that is how uh, you look at science. So that is a summary that we did uh, the last time. Now, uh, I've taken about half an hour, 40 minutes to explaining regression. It was worth doing that. Today, what I would like to do is uh, now move on to another class of predictive models called classification. Are we together? Classification. Before I move on to it, I would like to take any questions that you guys have on regression before we uh, close the chapter on it. We are closing the chapter on the theory of it, guys, but not on the practical. We will do one more practical lab on regression. Any questions, guys? You're all very quiet. So one announcement to make, uh, Anil Pandey is here. Uh, he's a very senior architect in Silicon Valley. Uh, he has made a lot of contributions to a lot of very important projects in his career. And uh, he has graciously agreed to be uh, essentially a guide to all of you and help you with your labs. So if any one of you are having problems, please reach out in Slack to Anil Pandey. He'll help you with that. All right. So... Um, I'll repeat what I said. Anil Pandey is here, and he's graciously agreed to be um, to help you guys uh, with the lab. Right? He's the teaching assistant, and it's, it's, uh, he's really very senior here in Silicon Valley. He has achieved a lot, made major contributions to many, many important projects. Uh, he has actually uh, contributed, and I think, uh, been in the leaderboard of Kegel competitions and so forth. And uh, so uh, it is, uh, reach out to him, he's an excellent resource. He's here in the uh, in this session and you can reach out to him for help. Yeah, right. uh, thank you, Asif, yeah. Right. Yeah, so you can reach out to me like if there are any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, thank you, Anil. Uh, thank you. All right, guys. So uh, with that, I would like to give uh, exactly five minutes break. It's 10. How much is it? 11.16. Could we just take a five minutes break before we start with the next topic? Uh, make sure, just think about regression in your mind. Close your eyes. Think about regression. See if you basically have the concepts right. See, guys, the libraries will come and go. Today, you are doing the lab with Scikit-Learn. Tomorrow, it would be something else. Today, you are using Python. Quite likely in, five, in 10 years, you won't be using Python, you'll be using something else. But it is, the, it is the conceptual understanding of a subject that stays with you for the rest of your life. Programming or this, programming in data science is anyway easy, but even to the extent that it is, it keeps coming and going. Uh, in my generation, I used to do programming in uh, what is today called machine learning or data science. Uh, guess in which language, can anybody guess?
Any guesses, guys? What one? Exactly. Uh, I used to do, I spent a lifetime doing my uh, life in Fortran. And uh, despite what people will tell you, a Fortran is actually not dead. Uh, as you can see on my desk is a book on Fortran, modern Fortran. The word modern should give you an idea that Fortran is not dead, despite what people say. Most of the mission critical computations today are still being done in Fortran around the world, uh, though it's not much used in commercial space because you don't expect people in the industry to be that deeply or scientifically trained. So when you do scikit in NumPy, you may not realize it. You're doing it in Python, but actually you're doing it in Fortran because the, your Python code is just calling down to the Fortran and C libraries. The, 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 so a lot of the code even today is always written in Fortran C, C++. Right? And these libraries that we learn in data science, the Python, the uh, R, or the Julia, the three popular scientific compute, the data science libraries, uh, in many ways, they are layers on top of the mountains of uh, work that generations of scientists, thousands, armies, like uh, tens of thousands of very, very talented researchers and scientists and mathematicians and physicists have contributed over the last uh, close to 50 years. And 50 years of intellectual property has accumulated. So uh, those traditions are not going away. But the one thing to know is that while C, C++, and Fortran are sort of there forever in many ways, uh, languages come and go. For example, SAS used to be very popular for statistical analysis or what we call data science today. It was a proprietary language. It's more or less fading out outside a small circle of commercial shops. In the same way, there was a way, there is still a very popular language, two languages, MATLAB and uh, Mathematica. They were very popular in academic circles and in the, in the industry uh, for doing uh, what today we call data science. Uh, but now uh, you don't hear that much about it outside academia. Uh, and what were they? Were they were, was SAS or, uh, for, or uh, MATLAB or Mathematica just uh, completely new frameworks from the ground up, new languages. No, they were all sitting upon the same Fortran C, C++ libraries that uh, people in my generation were creating and are still, those libraries are still going strong. Today, we have dominant was R and Python. Julia is the young kid on the block gradually gaining mind share. And in my view, it will take over after some time. But these libraries come and go. The foundational concepts remain the same. Uh, for example, the notion of uh, expressing error as sum squared error or mean squared error. This concept was created by Goss, the mathematician, in 1793. Uh, just think about that. Then Galton and Pearson, uh, when they use the word, they coined the word regression coming from regression towards the mean, uh, a concept uh, there, they observed in biology. So, we are looking at close to 200 years ago, right? So these ideas have stayed and mathematical ideas, deep ideas come slowly. And when they come, they come sort of with a ring of eternity to it. So it's important to understand the concepts. Libraries will come and go, are we together? So what I will do with that long explanation, I would suggest that you take five minutes to just reason through in your mind, what is it that you have learned? I'll take a break of five minutes, I'll drink some water, come back. And then we'll start on a new topic, which is classification. And so I will stop this particular video so because this was a review and we'll start a new topic after this.
Give me two minutes, guys. So any questions so far on regression? This is the last time to ask questions on regression. 
Anyone? All right, guys. So in that case, I'll get started. I'm starting the recording again. The topic now is classification. Classification is a predictive algorithm uh, in the sense that we talked about, inputs go in and a prediction comes out. It is, uh, as a predictive algorithm, it is also a supervised learning algorithm. In other words, uh, there are phases. You have to first train the machine, the algorithm, to build a model. Out of that model, then you use it to make predictions or to generalize it to new data and make predictions on new data. Right? So, what does classification do? As we discussed a little while ago, classification is used to identify the object or the class of objects that this data uh, it belongs to. So for example, if I tell you the height and the weight and the uh, certain features uh, of an animal, so those are the features, those are the inputs. And if you have to predict or identify what animals do these features belong to, that exercise is an exercise in classification. So I'll write it there in a little bit more formal terms now. Let's say that you, the basic premise is, uh, you write it in, in uh, first let me write it in a little bit more formal way so that it remains. What happens is you have a X vector go in and what comes out is a Y hat, which belongs to, where y hat belongs to some class G such that let's say cat, dog, etc. right? Some animal class, let us say. And these features could be, this is the feature vector. vector. So that's putting it a bit more formally and uh, more mathematically in a succinct way, but think of it in a more simple, like if you, if that is not the way you want to think of it, think of D features. Given an animal or given some animal, the feature, first feature could be the height, the second could be the weight, the third could be the age, the fourth could be whether that animal has wings or not, and the fourth could, and the next could be whether the animal has a tail or not, and the next could be how many legs does the animal have. And what you have to do is you have to predict y hat. Remember, predictions wear a hat, y hat, and you have to tell is it a cat, is it a dog, is it a horse? Right? Is it a cow? What is it? So you have to pick from a finite set. Pick from a finite set G. Right? Yeah, from a finite set G, you have to pick. So that is an exercise in classification. Now, there are many classifiers out there. Uh, lots of them, if you ask how many classifiers there are. Uh, they are like huge number, almost countless number of classifiers that are out there. Now, now that, that's, then you ask this question, how do we learn about all of them? So the thing is, you never learn about all of them. You learn on a need to learn basis, but you need to know, once you understand how classifiers behave, it is straightforward to uh, pick up a few and then pick up the rest as the need arises. Right? Uh, based on your problem set, based on what you're doing, you will use the appropriate classifier. So when a classifier makes a prediction, so let's play a little game and we say that there is a classifier which is given the data and you have to tell whether it is a cow, let's say it's a cow, it's a duck. Actually, let me just take two, uh, just to keep things simple. So this is the reality. Huh? Reality is this. Ground truth is this, uh, or ground truth, right? Truth is this, but suppose you make a prediction model from model, 
Suppose you have that, and let us say that you had, uh, let's take some number. You had, uh, for the sake of simplicity, assume that there were 50 cows and 50 ducks, equal number of cows and ducks that you use as for training data or for test data. Let's say that you have, test, you have trained a model M, classifier model M, classifier, and then you, you, you test it out on 50 cows and 50 ducks. So what can happen is, let's say that the prediction is cow, cow hat, or the prediction is duck, duck hat, right? So let's say that your model uh, predicts about, uh, let's take an example, some random number, I'll take 40, 40 cows as cows, but it confuses 10 cows as ducks. And likewise of the ducks, let's say that it confuses about five of the ducks as cows and 45 of the, uh, of the ducks, it gets right as a duck. So does this matrix make sense guys to you? Right. Uh, you, you notice that I broke up the, fi the 50 cows between, uh, where, like this row is what that data instance was predicted by your model to be. So you're saying that you showed it 50 cows and the model got 40 of the cows right as cows, but it confused 10 of the cows to be ducks. Likewise, you gave it 50 ducks, but then it confused five of the cows, uh, five of the ducks to be cows, but it got 45 of the ducks to be right. Now, uh, is this a good thing? Like, where are the mistakes? Let's think about it. Uh, would you say, or would you agree that this is a good thing? To identify duck as duck, if your model identifies a lots of ducks as ducks, that is a good thing, isn't it, guys? Likewise, if it identifies cows as cows, that is a good thing. On the other hand, this is bad. These are your mistakes. A duck being confused to be a cow or a cow being confused to be a duck, that is a bad thing. Those are mistakes. Red ones. mistakes or the more word that we use are errors. These are errors and the green ones are correct answers or correct predictions. Would you agree guys? Uh, I need some feedback. I want someone to uh, say that they are understanding this and it's looking uh, for me simple. Yeah. Yes, sir. It is simple, right? Okay. So in that case, now you ask yourself, what is the definition of a good model? How well is this model performing? In the case of regression, we had this mean squared error. In the case of classification, actually, it's simpler. You just say, all right, let's look at how many I got correct. Number, uh, number of correct over Total, total data, total data size. So what was the total data size? What's our denominator, guys? How many animals do we have? Two. Empty. No, no, no. How many total number of animals did we try this model on? 100. 100. 100. 100. <laughs> There are two classes, but there are 100 animals. And how many of those did we get right here? Okay. Come again? 85. 85, right? 45, 40 plus 45 is equal to 85. And so you say, this is your basic uh, sort of a metric of uh, the model. The name for this is accuracy. Accuracy. Are we together? Accuracy is defined. So here the accuracy would be 85%. Right? Now, is 85 good or bad? It depends on your situation. One of the questions that keeps coming up is this accuracy I got, is that accuracy good or bad? And the answer, surprisingly, is that it depends. Is 85 good, 85 bad? Depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Okay? It also depends on the data asymmetry. 
So let us say that uh, I change the problem. I make the problem that of detecting cancer. Now, and by the way, this is based on real data, real things uh, that happened in the late, uh, early 90s. So there is a disease uh, and this disease is well studied. Uh, and one of the early success stories with machine learning or AI, there's a disease called, I mean, obviously cancer is a terrible disease. In women, the, the fear often is of something called breast cancer. It is one thing that all women fear, just as men fear, I suppose, prostate cancer. And sooner or later, a large number of people tend to go through it. Now, when you do have lumps or uh, these things uh, in women, you want to hear that it's a benign lump. Benign means it is not cancerous. So in US at least, women all go, uh, usually once they're in their 20s, they go for something called mammograms. Uh, they get x-rays and if there is a lump felt or found in the mammogram, uh, then the, generally it, it means that you need to go through further testing. Now, most women, uh, if the lump is found, uh, it is found that they, the is lump is a lump, nothing to be worried about. But in some cases, those lump, they need further study because they may be cancerous. You may actually have breast cancer. So when you do that breast cancer studies, the history of the field is that they used to do pretty invasive tests. In other words, what would happen is if they found a lump uh, in the previous century for the longest time, they would literally cut open the breast, uh, leaving a big scar, go into that uh, lump area, uh, see what it is, take uh, core uh, uh, biopsies there, and then come out with the tissue, send it to histological exam. And then it turns out that you don't have cancer. Well, the good news is you don't have cancer. The bad news is now you have a scar on your body, right? a pretty invasive pr process. So obviously there is a need, there was a need for uh, less invasive processes. So the search for less invasive processes meant that can you just, instead of opening up a person, just go in with a fine needle, go to the lump and aspirate out some tissue. Aspirate means to suck out a little bit of the tissue. And then you look at the tissue under the microscope and you decide whether the person has a tumor, is it cancerous or benign? which is a huge improvement because uh, taking an injection is far less invasive than um, having a full-blown surgery that opens, opens you up and leaves a scar. So that was the process. The process is called fine needle aspiration. When you do fine needle aspiration, then you look at the tissue under the microscope. The problem that came is that the reliability amongst uh, the diagnostician, the pathologist looking at it was very poor the same person, one pathologist would mark it as malignant, another would mark it as benign, and it's a lot of error rate there. One of the things that people asked is, can we do better? Can we, can machine learning uh, create a model that can quickly and with equal reliability or more reliability, I mean, a reliability equal to some of the more trained pathologists and certainly better than the average pathologist, uh, tell whether the uh, the markers indicate a benign tumor or a malignant tumor. And so there was a breakthrough in the early 90s that made it possible. That is actually one of your homeworks. You will do that exercise in this particular workshop. But the reason I brought it up is for a slightly different reason. Look at the situation. When most of you go, let us say that you go for your uh, annual checkup and you're a woman. Uh, and if it is a man, I guess you go for a prostate checkup or something like that, uh, or something, some checkup. The probability that you have a tumor is, or you have cancer is very, very low, right? Uh, a very small proportion of people have that. But if you do have that, it is very, very important to catch the tumor early, to catch the cancer early. Because if you catch the cancer early, both in, I'll just focus on breast cancer for women, so I don't keep repeating myself. It's true for other forms of cancer, for example, for prostate cancer in men and so forth. The, the, the point is that if you catch it early, it is, 
it is almost completely curable. Uh, you go through a few unpleasant months of chemotherapy and radiation, but that's about it. Uh, today, we can cure, we can basically uh, bring a person back from breast cancer and put into remission forever. It never comes back in a large number of cases. Uh, so catching early is important. Right? How do you catch them early? So let's do an experiment. Suppose uh, you, you are given a lot of MRI, the, the, the x-rays, and you are asked to build a model that tells whether a person has or does not have a tumor. Are we together? Whether they need to even, I mean, whether benign or uh, malignant doesn't matter, whether you need to do fine needle aspiration at all or any invasive procedure at all. Uh, healthy people, young people, for example, they'll have a completely clear x-ray. Right, uh, so you go to that, and now let's say that the the prevalence of cancer is in one in thousand X-rays. Right, uh, it, that would certainly be true in the Western Hemisphere because everybody gets to, goes through regular checkups. So X-rays and these things are done on an annual basis in the U.S. Uh, it may not be so true in India. I don't know if in Bangor you guys are uh, in the different cities that you are, how often you go through diagnostics. But in US is the norm. Everybody goes through it at least twice a year. The different kinds of tests doesn't mean that they go through uh, x-rays twice a year. But they, you do go through an x-ray about a, once or once a year or something like that, a mammogram if you're a woman. So uh, most people will be absolutely healthy. So let's say that the incidence is one in thousand. I'm just throwing out a number. It may be high, it may be low. I don't know medically where it stands, but uh, it sounds right. <coughs> so suppose it is one in thousand. So you want a machine learning model that catches it. But suppose your accuracy is 99%. Right? Would you trust that machine? Would you trust an AI algorithm? I'm posing you a question. Whose accuracy is about 99%? Yes. Yeah, it seems as though you would. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else who differs? Actually, no. I'll tell you why. So suppose you are a quack. And uh, for example, in India, it's common that a lot of uh, quacks, they, they'll put up a board claiming that they have all the medical degrees, especially in small remote towns and villages. They'll claim to be doctors. Uh, ultimately, who's there to check? And uh, they will be dispensing quack medicines. Okay? They would not be trained in any of the traditions, either Ayurveda or um, the, West, uh, the, the modern medicine or anything like that either alternate medicine or that, they, they, would, they wouldn't have any proper training. But they're just, they're quite literally quacks in the sense that they know nothing, but they claim to be doctors. So you go to such a person and all, all that he says uh, is you are totally fine, right? Because he doesn't really know how to read an x-ray, so he declares everybody to be fine. What will be the accuracy of prediction of that doctor, of that quack? If the incidence of... Uh, the tumor is one in 10,000, what will be the accuracy? Can you guess, guys? So let, let's work it out. So one in the error rate, so the, the person is getting 9,999 out of 10,000 right. The only problem is the person who really has cancer or has a, uh, let's say, lump, that person is also being declared as uh, not having a problem. So there is one mistake, one mistake in 10K patients, right? And so 9,999 patients, he's giving the correct diagnosis. So what is the accuracy? Accuracy, again, is correct over total. What is that coming out to be, guys? That this is 99, oh no, uh, mm -hmm. one in thousand. So one in thousand. So 999. So yes, mm -hmm. so it will be 99.9% accurate. Do 
Do you see this, guys? Right? But does it mean anything? It doesn't mean much because this model entirely missed the one person whose life is at risk. Do you see that? And by the way, this has been the history of quacks over the centuries in every country. Uh, if you look at uh, modern medicine, the modern penicillin was discovered barely 100 years ago uh, or less than 100 years ago. And uh, pretty much all the more potent drugs came after that. So when it then there has been some uh, alternate systems of medicine. For example, India has Ayurveda and then there used to be the uh, Yunani system or the Hamdan system and so on and so forth, traditional. But they were far more effective for chronic diseases, you know, uh, body pain and things like that. A lot of chronic diseases they would address. But when it came to infections or in, uh, things like cancer, etc., we do know for a fact that, as far as I understand, uh, there were no scientific cures or ways of managing them or treating them till about a hundred years ago. Almost everything came after that, after penicillin and, uh, uh, and the discovery of the modern medicines, the pharmaceuticals. But doctors have existed for thousands of years, isn't it? For you go to 500 BC, 1000 BC, you again hear of doctors in all over Greek literature, ancient Western literature, Eastern literature, everywhere. Every country has had doctors and people. You ask those people, how in the world could they be curing anything at all? When we go back and look at it, we realize that actually most illnesses are self-limiting. They cure themselves. You have an upset stomach, stomach, wait for a few days, it could, uh, you know, uh, your, your, the germ will flush itself out of your body and you'll be fine again. You develop a fever, you will recover. Like, for example, today, I seem to have a little bit of fever and cold, but I do know that in two days or three days or whatever it takes, this thing will run through the system. I don't need to take medicines for it, right? Uh, except maybe if the temperature goes up, I can bring it down or something like that. So most diseases cure themselves. Right? So when you go to a physician and the physician gives you, let's say, some colored water, right? uh, all these so-called mixtures, uh, nice looking mixtures that used to be there, gives you one of them and you get cured. What used to happen is, uh, and this is now our understanding, that the patient would now develop an extraordinary trust in the doctor because it's the doctor who in a way cured the patient. And the doctor would be, would develop extraordinary faith in the textbook that taught it that that colored mixture cures people of whatever disease it is, let's say uh, a fever or something like that, right? For all these centuries, obviously it was very hard to remove the confirmation bias uh, when the doctors read those textbooks that said, use this for this illness and use that for that illness. And when they would do that, uh, sure enough, the patients would become okay. So it would confirm their bias that those medicines work. Today, of course, we know that those medicines are nonsense. They never worked. In the same way, you uh, look at any doctor and you will find that there are lots and lots of patients who will swear that this doctor is a magician. He is really a great doctor. However bad the doctor would be, there will always be a group of patients who would uh, absolutely adore the doctor. I say this as a person who actually has been very closely associated with the medical profession. It's, it's a fact, right? So, uh, but what people don't know that sequence is not causation. In other words, just because you fell ill, then you went to the doctor and then you became okay, does not mean that the doctor cured you. You could, you would have been cured anyway in a few days, whether or not you had met the doctor. Okay. So uh, our mind has the habit of uh, treating sequence as causation, but it isn't. Okay. So uh, a very silly example of that would be uh, to say that, see, I came to Silicon Valley in 1999. Let's say, just take a date, right? I ended up here. 
after my graduate school and right away there was a dot com boom so would it there would it not be silly for me to claim that because i came to silicon valley silicon valley had a tremendous uh, explosion of prosperity and uh, innovation that would be uh, obviously completely uh, stupid right in the same way uh, it would be uh, what but it's hard to see that it is the same reasoning to say that because because i went to the doctor and after that i became cured therefore i can assume that i was cured because of the doctor so today in medicine for example we have the double blind study when we want to see the effectiveness of a medicine what we do is we create a study in which we take let's say 100 patients to 50 of them we would give the real medicine to 50 of them we would give them a placebos placebos are medicines that look exactly like the real one but actually is filled with just uh, inert material maybe chalk right internally if it is a tablet and the doctors wouldn't know uh, the doctors wouldn't be told who the real patients are i mean who are the, who are the guys getting the real medicine and the patients of course wouldn't know whether they are getting the real uh, the medicine or placebo they'll always be told that they are getting the, the real medicine right then what you do is uh, the person doing the clinical trial only knows they keep observing how many is there a difference in the rate of recovery between people who took a medicine and the people who did not take a medicine so you need to demonstrate that the people who took the medicine uh, more of them recovered compared to the people who got the placebo right and then you can establish that the medicine is actually effective right Uh, these these are very real things by the way uh, even today uh, we are doing that with the covid uh, uh, this vaccines that we are creating right uh, th- there is some of that going on you always do double blind studies now as a gold standard but anyway the reason i brought it up in classification is that it sort of creates a backdrop of how you should use to determine what measure to use for the accuracy you ask yourself what is the asymmetry in data right so suppose in this particular case it is the accuracy of a blind a useless algorithm would be 99.9% so means your model you have a useful model you have trained a model to do something practical only if it your model model mc the accuracy of your model let me just call it accuracy accuracy of your model exceeds 99.9% in this situation would you agree guys yeah yeah, yeah. you would agree it has to catch those rare cases or another way to put it is accuracy may not even matter the only thing that matters is did you you may actually be willing to lose some accuracy so suppose i do this out of the 1000 people i declare five of them as positive cases positive that is a cancer potentially cancer patients potentially cancer cases so now but so long as this five includes that one person who genuinely has a lump would you take now look at the accuracy of this algorithm it will actually be lower than the than the fraud or the quack one uh, this accuracy is only 995 isn't it or why go at 5 let's take 10 let's say that you predict 10 of them and you will have 990 uh, cases you are 990 cases you are right actually 991 cases you'll be right and uh, nine cases you'll be wrong because out of this 10 one is correct nine are wrong right and so what happens is your accuracy is much lower accuracy is 99.1 much lower than 99.9 but would you consider this model let me call it m2 uh, to would you trust m2 or would you trust m1 the previous model m1 Which one? come again m2 
uh, some of you are arguing for the uh, previous model, 99.9 .9 model, and some are arguing for the, the M2, which has lower accuracy. So those of you who are arguing for the previous model, give a reasoning. Why would you take the previous model? Do you have an explanation? Why would you take the previous model? Uh, because the error is less in the previous model than compared to the second one, sir. Yes, that is one explanation. Anyone else has a different opinion or has a different reason? Anyone who prefers M2? Yeah, sir. M2 would be better than uh, M1, I think. And why would it be better? Uh, why? Because it's actually uh, the percentage was low, but we have uh, 10 cases actually positive. So um, it's better than that. Uh, that include the, uh, yes, the actual cases. So think of it, guys, from the perspective of you being the person. If you have tumor, would you go to uh, equipment that catches it or would you go to the equipment that doesn't catch it? You would, you would want to be tested by that equipment that catches it. Now, it may have false positives. You know, Nine people are wrongly diagnosed to have cancer, but what will happen? Suppose, uh, uh, suppose nine people uh, are scared now and they're told you have cancer. The way in medical you would do it is you would put them through further tests. Now, suddenly there's a chance that those are all those 10 people have cancer you would do blood tests and you would do secondary tests and now you would do fine needle aspiration or you would do a core biopsy go and take some tissue out and check whether they have it at the end of it what will happen nine of the people you would have scared unnecessarily in the beginning but then you would say no everything is fine go home right so while that is a nuisance it is not as bad as missing the person who genuinely has tumor. Because when you miss a person who has tumor, in a few months, the tumor spreads and then it is too late to save the person, isn't it? And that is why the previous model is not as useful as the second model, even though the accuracy of the second model is actually lower. Okay. And so this is how you have to think about classifiers, guys. You have to ask yourself, what is the purpose I'm using it for? And so what matters more? What matters more is I don't miss the positive case. And to not miss the positive case, if you have to sacrifice a bit of accuracy, no problem. Right? And therefore, the point that I'm making is, it is not just accuracy that is a measure of how good a classifier is. There are other measures. And the, uh, I will talk about uh, two of these, precision, Recall, there are other, many of them. So accuracy is just one of them. Precision recall, sensitivity, specificity, sensitivity, specificity. And we will do the definitions of this next time. But I'm just planting the idea in your mind that what matters is that there are many different measures of the goodness of a model and the content, the situation decides which measure that we do. So when you don't want to miss the positive test cases, you want to go for high recall. High recall for early, early cancer diagnosis, cancer diagnostic tests. Right? And what happens is that while the first test is good, it will produce a lot of false positives. What you want to make sure is that before you give chemotherapy, you have done a lot of other tests. Now the test that you do before you are sure that a person has, uh, before you start chemotherapy should be, it should be very sure that the person really has cancer. So the thing that you are being, uh, that you focus on is that test should have very low false positive. So the, the, the final test, that should come after, you know that by the time you reach the final test, if you have even the slightest inkling or possibility of cancer, you have been marked as positive. So the job of the final test is to 
but tell that you don't have cancer if you don't have it right so the so one second i have a doubt here so yes sir in case of m1 you told uh, m2 is better than m1 but here in both the cases actually it is equipment which is showing it so whereas in second cases the ninth person is detected positive whereas the one is correct and the line is wrong but yes. in this case also the ninth person will be given the treatment of same cancer thing which is no. not required no no it is not that's the point i'm making see uh, so maybe i should dwell on it more see what happens in diagnostics is there are different tests the regular tests that you do the annual checkups etc they do they are on the side of or they are biased towards detecting or marking you as positive if there is the slightest chance that something is wrong right so if there is a slightest chance in your x-ray that there may be a lump it will mark you as positive but then when you are marked as positive you don't immediately go in for chemo or something like that what happens is then the doctor starts doing more aggressive tests so for example they will do fine needle as in india you do fine needle aspiration that is pretty much uh, the gold standard there most places will do that they will go in with a needle they'll aspirate out a tissue and by the way fine needle aspiration is true for all forms of cancer in india right whether it is breast cancer or any other form of cancer they go there then they aspirate out a bit of tissue and they look under the microscope now and they check whether you really have it right and then they will do other tests uh, automated tests also in the west at least they do that uh, and then uh, obviously if they are really really sure before they put you through chemo they will go and um actually open take a more invasive approach go and do a core biopsy in other words uh, make a small cut go in um, endoscopically and take a core biopsy of the region right of the tissue come out put it under the microscope and so on and so forth to be absolutely sure they won't put you through chemo just like that so what happens is and that's what we are that's the narrative i'm saying the early test you prefer m2 you want it to have it you don't want it to miss the positive case even though it produces a lot of false positives right so these are what there's a word for it it is false positive right uh, these are false positive but you but you allow that because you know that you have other safeguards other gates that will eliminate those later on whereas if you have a final test in the final test what do you want to do you don't want to, this is the door before the chemo right in this test you want to be absolutely sure that this person truly has cancer before you um mm. before you uh, you know bombard this person with chemo so then the the more uh you need to be you need to have very high specificity in other words you, it needs to say positive only for the people who are truly positive are we together it may have false at this moment you don't fear false negative because the early test would have caught up so here false negative is okay because you know that some other test has already taken care of that uh, but here you what you are making sure is that there are no false positive you want to make sure make sure no false low false positive Right. So let me summarize it a little bit for you. Uh, see, in the in the early test, right? Early test, the first test. Suppose there's a machine learning model there. What you want to do is you want to have low, false, negative. False negative. What is the definition of false negative? Means you do have cancer, but this test missed it. Missed it. that is very dangerous because you go home live your life happily and a few months later you get the shock that it has spread all over so the early test must have low false negative so the generally these tests which are given on a routine basis that's what you strive for they should be relatively non invasive and not lead to scars and so forth they should be like for example in us mammogram is the standard you go through mammogram you look at the x rays and so forth then but the from a machine learning perspective its requirement is you need low false negative the slightest hint that something is off it should just mark you positive then you will go through many many tests 
And then let's say that there's a final test. And let us say that all of these other tests are still saying you may have cancer. You want a final test because beyond the final test is chemo. Chemo, radiation, etc. And you know that these are very brutal treatments. They, they, they do remove the cancer, but in the process, they practically kill the patient, right? Uh, and do a lot of damage to the patient. So you don't want to send uh, somebody for chemo who is actually healthy. So what you do is, here your requirements are different. Low, false, positive. Isn't it? At this moment, what you focus on is low, false, positive, right? You don't worry about false negatives because this has, uh, the early test would have, uh, if this, if this comes after early test, you know that you don't have to worry about that. Are we understanding that now, guys? Yes, sir. Then it cannot be called as a model accuracy in that case, sir. Because yes. we are not getting a correct output. Yes, and that is the lesson I want to bring out. That see, people in this field and in the common world have overstated the value of accuracy. If you look at this carefully, in both the early test and the final test, Accuracy is a meaningless metric, right? The real metrics are low. The early test should have very low false negative rate and the final test should have very low false positive rate. Right? And, but the, and the reason I'm mentioning it to you is as you read your textbooks and uh, other things, some textbooks are good. Most are pretty mediocre actually. Um, and so, uh, in most fields, for example, in mathematics, when a textbook is written, at least in the West, they are written to a very high standard. You don't find mistakes in them. In this fast emerging field of data science, because it's moving so fast, actually, the quality of the books that you buy, these programming books, these data science books, is pretty terrible, actually. So it seems that anybody who has understood even the basics of data science immediately feels they need to write a book because then you know uh, good things will follow and sometimes the books are good sometimes they are not and when they are not good they do a lot of damage because you know now a person who understood things badly has perpetuated that now 100 people have read that book a thousand people have read that book and now they will also believe that to be true and continue with that kind of thinking one of the common things that you find sometimes is um, and i hear this the reason is you you know i work uh, in, in the company you, you know you interview people you get people so you ask them these questions and quite often you see that uh, almost all the young kids who come to interview, they have that misconception that accuracy is what you go after. Right? You ask them to write code and immediately they'll try to make it more accurate without thinking whether accuracy is the right thing to pursue. So keep that in mind, guys. Accuracy sometimes makes sense, but many times it doesn't make sense. It is in advertising too. Many, many things will say, uh, my accuracy is this percentage or that percentage. But see, the quack can go and say that he has a 99.9% .9 accuracy rate in uh, diagnosing cancer because he's telling everybody you're healthy. But that quack is a quack. And 99.9% .9 accuracy means nothing. Actually, it is uh, far more useless than a test, an early test, which has a much lesser, which has a lesser accuracy, but has a low false negative rate. Okay? That's the lesson that I wanted to bring about. So all of these things uh, can be derived from the confusion matrix. There's a, this particular matrix that you saw, it has a name to it. This is called, it has a famous name. It is the confusion matrix. matrix, matrix, confusion matrix. So it is like how confused your model gets. So if your model is perfect, what would be the sign of a perfect model? So for example, cow, duck, cow, hat, duck, hat. You would say that what you would have is a perfect model would be 50, 50, 0, 0. Do you see that guys? No mistakes. 
principal axis would contain the principal diagonal would contain all the all the data points and the off diagonals will have will be empty means all the cows were correctly identified as cows all the ducks were correctly identified as ducks now what happens in general is you don't achieve 100% accuracy unless you have a very clean data and a very simple uh, explanation for it if the explanation is very for example if i were to ask you uh, can you tell the difference between a cow and a duck we as human beings would have a near perfect uh, accuracy or near perfect results no errors especially if the cows and ducks are just roaming around us isn't it it would be very easy and you would get but if you give it to an algorithm algorithms also can achieve that level of accuracy but quite often data has noises models are imperfect so you will get a certain error rate and so based on the confusion matrix the things that you want to do is look at all of these measures and we'll talk about these measures in the their mathematical expressions the next time okay. but today i wanted to give you guys a big picture of uh, what it is Uh, like uh, and how you judge a model and i haven't talked about any classifier actually next time also i'll make it a theory session i noticed that we are beginning to run out of time uh, so the real uh, we'll talk about logistic regression we'll talk about a few more regression algorithms decision trees and random forest and so forth um, so there are many algorithms that you use and these are the great classics of data science and machine learning they used on a day to day basis very very frequently and you don't even know that these things are being used uh, all the time but they are used but before but today i'm focusing just on the uh, irrespective of which classifier model it is how do you do the diagnostics of this model <coughs> how do you know that a model is good so there is one more thing that is important it is called the receiver operator operator characteristic actually let me write it in caps so that i don't make typos uh, it is called roc receiver operator characteristic characteristic and usually it is called the roc curve so characteristic curve well that sounds scary term very very technical term if they are scary and technical terms so this receiver operator characteristic curve the word is historic it comes from signal processing it has been borrowed from signal processing that is why that strange name most people don't call it by that strange name they just use the word roc curve now what is this roc curve this roc curve is a property of a model is a property of a model and how it behaves on test data test data or real data data what happens is that there are two axes here one is false positive and a true positive and both of these go from 0 to 1 so 0 0 uh, 0 1 1 1 of course so what it means is this point you have no uh, neither false positive nor a uh, true positive right the 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 model is such that it's basically uh, everything is negative let's say right so um, on the other hand this point so let me call it a b b point represents a situation in which you have no true positive everything is just false positive right that's a pretty bad model this is a c represents a model in which everything is true positive and your false positive rate of the model is zero that is a pretty nice model you would imagine you want a model that 
catches cancer when there is cancer, but doesn't produce any false positive. In other words, it doesn't alarm anybody who doesn't have cancer by telling them or scaring them that they may have cancer. And then this is the other thing in which the true positive and the false positive rates are the same, uh, sort of a very high true positive and very high uh, false positive also. Right. So uh, now what happens is the, this line, as you can imagine, this is actually a square, even though I made it out as a rectangle. Uh, this is a 45 degree axis. What happens is that useless models, the people that make random predictions, they, there's that. Now what happens is as you change the threshold of accuracy, yeah, let us say that, uh, let's take an example. Let us say that the model looks at the color of a solution, you do some test, chemical test, and then light passes through it and then some color comes out. And the color could be anywhere in the degree of redness, right? So how red it is, zero red or fully red. And so somewhere there is a cutoff. I'm deliberately using these words, I'll use more precise words next time, but I'm giving a hand waving argument here. There's some point of redness at which you say, consider it positive and below that consider it negative. Let's say that uh, the, if the solution is sufficiently red, you suspect cancer. If the solution color is not red enough, very likely red or some other color, you consider it not cancer. So based on this, you will realize that based on where you put the cutoff, your, your positive, true positive and true negative rates will be different. And it will in fact have a curve a good one will go like this. In other words, with a very low false positive rate, you have achieved a very high a true positive rate, right? A very high true positive rate. Are we, are we together? Think about it this way. Uh, if, you, if your machine is good, and very accurate, you know the right cutoff such that at that cutoff, you may occasionally have a few false positives, but you get a lot of true positives. You know, people who are having cancer, you catch them all. This is the proportion of people. Let's say that 99% of the people who have cancer, you catch them, even though cancer is relatively rare in people. You would want an algorithm that is like that. So this one, right, let me mark it as green. This is good. And what is bad, uh, models that are not good will have something like this result. In other words, a true positive and false positive are equally balanced. Now there are models that actually can be like this, even be worse than the, uh, worse than random. And it happens sometimes, so watch out for those. The point to remember is that in the ROC curve, this is, this curve is the, uh, these are the ROC curves. All of these are ROC curves. Now, this is a little bit too much to learn in one day uh, in diagnostics. So we'll repeat this concept over and over again a few times. Now, now you say that the green is good and the red is not so good. How would you quantify it? One easy way to quantify it is how much area there is below the curve. So you would agree that there is more area below the green curve than there is below the red curve. Right. Now, the total area of this box is one because the height is one and the width is one. So total area is one. So you know that the, the area under the curve will be somewhere between zero and one, somewhere in this interval. And the bigger it is, the better. So there is a word for this. It is called the AU, area under ROC curve. And the symbol for that in classification theory, classifier theory is A-U-R-O-C. Uh, the way you write it is capital O-A, little u-r-o-c, all in capitals. Area under ROC curve, that is the term, right? Under ROC curve. And usually that is a good measure of um, how well your algorithm is doing. Right. Remember, it's only one of the metrics. It is yet another metric, but a very good one to determine how good your algorithm is. And we will use that with time. Uh, we will use that. 
so next time we have a choice, we can either do a lab or I could explain to you the classifier theory. I'll see. Or maybe, maybe we'll do the lab so all of these ideas become real. Uh, we will do a lab without me giving you an idea of how those algorithms work, but you will sort of do the lab and see them work. And then the week after that, we will do the theory in which we will learn about, um, I'll teach you about some, at least one classifier in depth, logistic regression. Now, the, 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 the confusing thing is, do you notice that the word regression is sitting in there? It is actually, not regression at all, despite the name, but classification. How confusing can it be? But for historic reasons, it is called logistic regression. So logistic regression is actually a classification algorithm. Uh, it's a very popular algorithm and very widely used. And uh, uh, it's a great, thing to start using in practical day-to-day -day life. So we, we seem to have run out of time. Next time when we meet, let us do a few labs. We'll do it, we'll classify some data and uh, we will actually use a breast cancer data also as an example. And we'll use that to uh, illustrate how these things work. But without understanding logistic regression, just understand what classifiers do, what their metrics are, and how to use them. Uh, we will do that. And then subsequently, in the week after that, two weeks from now, I will uh, cover the theory of logistic regression. Is that a plan, guys? Yeah. Let's do that. All right, guys. And so I'm stopping the recording, so you guys feel free to ask questions. Remember guys that these videos are all, all online. Now this uh, YouTube live, it is available on YouTube of course, since the, lecture, since the session started and it, is, it will remain on YouTube forever. The cleaned out version of these videos, my videographer will clean it out and uh, post it to the course page. Typically that happens in two, three days, eh? in two days a more cleaned out version would be there without the gaps, without the breaks and so forth that we took. And so you will get two videos, one which was a review of regression and one which was the introduction to classification. Are we together? You can do that. Uh, by the way, it's a, let us review that. Let's see if you understood the concept. Classification is a, where is classification? Classification is in some sense predicting a type or identifying a type, right? That is all it is. It, it is a mathematical function internally to a machine that somehow can do that. Now, we didn't go into how to build a classifier, the theory of a classifier. I thought it was more important for the lab perspective to know how it works and how do you judge a classifier? how good it is. In other words, what are the classifier? Model metrics, people use the word model metrics. In the case of regression, it was simple. Mean squared error or mean uh, absolute error. In the case of classification, it's a little bit more involved. The root of all these things is the, is the confusion matrix, <coughs> which looks like this, how many ducks you got as ducks, how many were you wrong in? Cows, how many cows you got as cows and how many cows you got wrong, so forth. So then people talk of different measures. The most obvious one is accuracy. The total number of correct over the total number of data, proportion of correct. Uh, but what I, if there's a lesson that I taught you, hopefully in the subsequent discussion is, accuracy is actually, in many situations, a meaningless metric. Right? You have to look at a situation and decide what is the what are you looking for? So we took the example of breast cancer and we realized that if you want to do early test, you know, screening test, the people word in US they use the word screening test. You get screened if for any signs of a disease. 
So the screening test should have low false negative rate, whereas a final test should have low false positive rate. Right? If you don't have it, it should say that you don't have it so that you are not exposed to a brutal regime of chemo and radiation. Then we learned about the receiver operator characteristic curve, quite a mouthful. And the word comes from signal processing domains, but uh, we usually call it machine learning. The term is ROC curve. ROC curve is a property of a model and how it behaves on test data, real data. And it is a curve that makes a trade off between false positives and true positives. Right? If you want to, in the limit, you can get complete 100% true positive in most models only if you are willing to accept a lot of false, neg a false positives also, which is unacceptable. So what you do is you pick where you want to put the cutoff, right? At which you have already achieved most of the, like for example, here or here, uh, here or here, where you have achieved most of the value of the model. It, it catches most of the positive cases, but has a relatively low false negative. But on the other hand, if it is a very uh, scary uh, disease like uh, cancer, then maybe you need to be here. You need to catch more, uh, make sure that most or all of the uh, true positives are caught, even though you end up with a lot of false negatives. Right? So we will learn about all of these in lab next time. And the algorithm that we will learn is called logistic regression. Logistic regression, despite the very confusing presence of the word regression in it, is uh, not a regression algorithm, but a classification algorithm. It is the only classification algorithm that I know which has a confusing name. But there are many, many such classifiers. Classification is a very rich area of machine learning. Okay. So there are like this, we will do decision trees, random forest, support vector machines, gradient XG, you know, gradient boosting and so forth. And uh, th those things we will do from an experimental perspective, but from a theory perspective, we're understanding that, of course, uh, usually people who come to the labs, the, who take the whole workshop sequence with me, uh, they do it slowly over time because it takes a lot of time to understand this theory. Uh, people are with me typically for six, seven months and in six to seven or eight months. And in that, they sort of go through the whole thing. Like for example, I'm proud to say that the 2020 batch is finishing in December. The people who joined in April, uh, May actually, a May batch is finishing this December and uh, they are all getting ready to get their job in the top tier companies. The 2019 batch was extraordinarily successful. Uh, support vectors managed to place uh, some of them in the top universities of US uh, for graduate school, right? And uh, some of them in very good uh, jobs, Amazon and Facebook and Google and so forth. So, uh, but then uh, all that success comes for people who sort of have taken that whole six months of rigorous study. And when you do that, you learn, because the field is vast, you learn a lot, you learn about the deep neural networks, deep learning, you learn about many theories and uh, lots of things in that. So, because this is a much more abbreviated uh, workshop, and also we are catering to an audience. A lot of you uh, clearly told me you don't have computer science background. You're just switching into data science. So I've tailored it to be the entryway or a doorway to data science. So I hope those of you who are entering this field, are you finding the explanation simple and are you able to follow through? Is it helping you? Uh, would somebody who uh, comes fr not from a, a computer science background, please give a feedback? <coughs> Anybody would like to give a feedback, guys? You're all quiet. I don't know if anybody is even here. Maybe people have uh, joined and gone off to their work or slept. Any feedback? Yes, Asif, uh, this is really very informative and uh, it's really a nice class. Oh, thank you. Anyone else, guys? Anybody else there in India has a feedback? Uh, hi, uh, Srikanth here. So mm -hmm. I am uh, 
like uh, academically i'm not from uh, computer science background but last uh, past 10 years i am into like this development java dot net like that mm-hmm. but uh, machine learning and uh, all this mathematics of course we learned before but uh, we have forgotten mathematics but machine learning is uh, since in our organization there is option to switch there and i think uh, what you are uh, teaching us it's uh, really great uh, to continue and uh, no I, maybe i feel confident that uh, i can take assignment i can ask my managers give me or uh, put me in machine learning project in uh, near future yes good to hear that huh? that is the goal that after this basic workshop you'll be able to get your foot in the door you know get a job in data science and start doing that machine learning and start doing that so do the labs guys if you do the labs i feel or i hope that you will get started you'll get your job into machine learning or data science all right guys so if that is that is it i'd like to end the session now uh could could folks from mlp please stay back thank you sir thank you sir thank you asif Ah, you're welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.